everyone. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you guys. Nice to see you guys all rocked up, 10 a.m. Um, cool. So my name's Kevin. Uh, if you don't know me already, um, if you don't know who I am, then it's probably, I mean, you didn't come to our PSP, I guess. Um, but it's good to see you all. Um, today, what I'm going to be covering is biochem. Um, and honestly, it's not really biochem, most of what I'm going to be covering. It's honestly just like random stuff that other one people didn't really want, and so I ended up with. Um, so, hey -o. Um, so enzymes and macromolecules and those kind of pathways is admittedly biochem, but osmolarity and tonicity, not really. Um, but I guess in terms of an overview of what my slides will be like and all that kind of stuff, I don't actually have that many slides. Um, 70 is not actually that many, because um, they're not very full. <laughs> There's like two sentences on them sometimes. So I really won't be going for the full hour, which definitely means that I want you guys to be asking questions if you're ever confused about anything that I say. So if I say anything and it doesn't make sense, it's either because I mucked it up or because I need to answer something and answer, clarify something for you guys, okay? So if there's any time you have any questions, um, <laughs> there's a person up there, um, please ask. Um, for those online, ask on um, the chat for, oh, there it is. Um, chat on Zoom as well, um, just because um, you can ask me as well there. Um, Ron, my audio's not on. No, I don't think my audio's on. Um, and yeah, cool. So just as an overview actually of your exam, because I'm your first talk, uh, first speaker today, so I get I can. Um, overall, your exam is two exams this year, which is different to every other year, which was all last year anyway, which was as one. Um, in terms of questions, there's only multiple choice questions, or most part, there's like three short answers per exam. Um, those short answers are going to be on HKS and like psychiatry. So most of your questions are a multiple choice, and I say this so that you guys can chill out a little bit. Um, I get the stress in the room is like quite high. Um, and I guess that's why I'm here. But in all honesty, try not to stress out too much. It's your first year, first time exams. They don't even really matter, I don't think. They don't matter, apparently. Um, so don't stress. But if you have any questions, please ask. Um, but yeah, so the first thing I want to cover is osmolarity, tonicity, and fuel, uh, body fluids. So here we go. Um, so fluid distribution, this is kind of just important just so you kind of know. Um, your body consists of 60% water, there's a bit less in females, so no good reason really. Um, this fluid is distributed through the body where two-thirds of the fluid is intracellular, one-third is extracellular. Um, this doesn't really have that much of a significance, it's just it's a fun fact for you to know. Um, fluid moving to ECF into the, from the ECF into the ICF, that's kind of an important concept but it kind of makes sense, right? So if you inject something into you, you're not going to be injecting things into your cells because that's kind of impossible. Um, so they inject it into your ECF and that then form moves into your ICF. Um, cool. As you can see, this is what I mean by my Um So osmols and osmolarity, these are a fairly important concept for you guys to know what it means. So osmols is the total count of all the moles in a solution. So this means that if you have a sodium chloride, that will dissociate into two different molecules, a sodium and a chloride. That will mean that there's, I mean, if there's five moles of sodium chloride in your solution, therefore there are 10 osmoles in that solution because the sodium chloride, each of the sodiums, each of the chlorides will count as five. Five plus five equals 10. Make sense? Yes? Cool. Um, and so osmolarity is just the total osmoles per the volume of the solution. So it's millimoles per liter. Um, in medicine, this is normally water, but it doesn't have to be. But it's going to be water in your exam, so don't worry too much. Um, diffusion and osmosis. So diffusion is just a spontaneous net movement of molecules piled down their concentration gradient. Um, this is influenced by the plasma membrane, as in so many some things can go across it. So um, small, non-charged, um, non-polar molecules and that kind of stuff will go through. Um, and other things will require um, require active transport to go through. So there are certain channels or certain proteins to move through the channels. Um, if you did U12 chemistry of U12 bio, that should be fairly familiar to you guys, but hopefully it's familiar to all of you guys by now. Um, osmosis is the movement, is the movement, the spontaneous net movement of water from a region of low solute concentration to one that's higher. This is basically because the solutes can't move across. So your body or your 
I guess physics is like, I need to move the other way around because this isn't going to work, right? And so the water moves across the bed, effectively achieving the same kind of concept and same kind of balance. Um, osmotic pressure is literally just that concept in terms of it's the pressure required to move or for that fluid to come across. Um, it's the idea where um, the amount of force that the osmoles and the, the, the molecules in that solution is pulling water across, that force is called the osmotic pressure. Um, and this pressure is relative to difference in osmolarity across the semi-permeable membrane. Um, also, if I'm speaking too fast or if I'm speaking too close to the mic, let me know as well, because last year we had some pretty annoying speakers that were like this, and that was kind of annoying, um, so let me know. Um, but anyway, tonicity, this is the count of the effective osmols, and I don't think effective osmols is a word that actually exists in science, but it's one that Professor Wright likes to use, and that it kind of makes sense. So basically all it means is that these osmols don't move, and they're effective because they cause osmosis to occur. Um, these are impermeable, as well as those that are effectively impermeable, which is your sodium chloride kind of molecules, right? So those ones come in, but they get kicked out almost instantly, and so therefore they are effectively impermeable because they don't really come across, and so therefore they are also effective osmols. Um, these don't move, and so therefore they contribute to osmosis. That's why they're known as effective osmols um, to us, anyway. Um, okay, so this is some terminology, and this is quite important just so you guys don't get confused when you see questions, um, because questions in this kind of, I guess, topic will mostly come across as um, they're giving you a solution that is hypo-osmolar, for instance, and then you have to know what those mean. So basically, hypo, iso, and hypo are all um, in, comparison, in comparison to the solutions they're in. So, Hyperosmolar is the higher osmoles in the extracellular solution. Isoosmolar means the osmoles in the intracellular and extracellular solutions are the same. And hyperosmolar means there's higher osmoles in the intracellular solution. Um, hypotonic is the same idea. Hypotonic, isotonic, and hypotonic are all the same ideas. Um, but hypotonic is important because it will cause fluid to flow from inside the cell to outside the cell. Um, because it's aiming to try and diffuse that water into the outside cells, extracellular solution to kind of dilute it back down. Um, isotonic, nothing will happen. Hypotonic, fluid will come from outside the cell, uh, from outside cell into the cell um, to try and fill that concentration back up. Osmolarity and tonicity are not the same things. Um, hopefully you guys know that. But the idea is that some solutions can be isosmolar but not isotonic. Um, if that doesn't really make sense in terms of how that's possible, I will show you in a quick second with urea, um, but that's kind of it. Um, Ron, can you take the solution on the Zoom? Yeah. Um, so why is this stuff important? So basically, you don't want your stuff to die. Um, you don't want your cells to explode or cells to shrivel when you give people some stuff through their IV lines. So the idea is that your red blood cells in an infinite tub. Um, so this is the infinite tub analogy that Chris Wright uses. Um, and this is basically because the extracellular fluid is so much larger than your individual little cell that any changes in your, or whatever compensatory method that your cell tries to do in terms of pulling water in and out will be not significant enough to really do anything. It's like if you try to drop um, some sugar into like the ocean, that ocean's suddenly not gonna become sweet because you chuck the sugar cube in there. It's gonna be like, still because you've done, haven't done anything, right? And that's the same kind of idea. So um, if the red blood cell is placed in a hypotonic solution, the water will flow in an attempt to equalize the concentrations, causing water to flow out, um, causing intracellular fluid to flow, causing your cells to crenate or shrivel. Um, if the red blood cell is placed in a hypotonic solution, the water will flow into the cell, attempt to equalize the concentration as well. And because you can never really equalize to a certain degree, it's like gonna be consistent enough, your cell will just explode and it will burst and that's bad. Um, and okay, so red blood cells. So red blood cells and extracellular fluid have a normal osmolarity of about 300 millimoles per liter. That's a very important number. Remember that number. Um, that's probably one of the three numbers that are gonna be very important in my whole slideshow. And the other two are on this slide as well. Um, so 300 millimoles per liter, learn that. Um, just because. Um, it's not like in real life, we don't think it's actually like 300, but it's close enough for us um, and for medicine really that it's going to be good enough. And so isotonic, hypotonic, and hypotonic will refer to this concentration in the blood. Um, there are two also important IV drips to consider, and these are 0.9% saline, again, remember that, and 5% dextrose, remember that. 
those are the three numbers that I really want you to remember from my whole lecture slide of 70 slides. Um, so that's a fun fact. Um, there's also urea, which is important conceptually in terms of the idea of isotonic versus isoosmolar, but the concentration of the number of 1.8% isn't really important. Um, it's just an example. All right, so saline. So 0.9% saline is isosmolar and isotonic to red blood cells. That's why it's 0.9% and not like 1% or 0% or whatever. Um, saline is just salt, and in reality, sodium is what we would really care about. Um, sodium is an effectively permeable, impermeable substance. Um, and so the idea is that even though it's a very small molecule, and so therefore you considerably would conceptually think it passed through the cell membranes, it doesn't really. Um, it doesn't really because it just kind of gets kicked out instantly. Um, and this is what makes it an effective osmol. Increased blood pressure and for dehydration. Um, that's kind of its purpose. Um, and dextrose. So 5% dextrose is isosmol and also isotonic to red blood cells. So this one's a little bit more complicated in terms of how it works. But conceptually, it's the same thing as injecting just straight water into your system without doing just that and killing all your blood cells in the process. So what it does is that it increases your ECF, but also your ICF over time. And this is because as you inject dextrose into your bloodstream, um, your body doesn't really treat it as a hypotonic solution because it is literally just the same isosmol isotonicity. But as it goes through your body and it kind of spreads everywhere, your body takes up the dextrose and uses it for energy quite slowly. As it does this, it metabolizes it and into water and that kind of stuff. But as it does it, it drops the tonicity of that solution you gave in ever so slightly over time. As that happens, the um, osmolarity changes in this way that you can kind of pull water into your cells as it becomes more hypotonic. That happens so slowly though, that it means your cells don't explode and it cleans, it's spread across your whole body instead of just being an isolated bit in your arm, for instance. And that means that you'll increase your ECF and your ICF without causing your cells to blow up. Um, does that make sense? Because dextrose is always a weird little thing. Yes? Cool. Um, and yeah, so it increases extracellular and extracellular fluids. So urea. So first and foremost, don't ever give urea. <laughs> um, I don't really see why you would give someone pee into their blood. Um, but the idea here is that it's 1.8% urea is isosmolar, but it's not isotonic. And this is because it is permeable and it's not an effective osmol. And this will mean water will flow um, when you give it. So when it is injected, water will rush into cells, causing um, no changes in the effective osmols, but will be basically just injecting straight water into their blood. Um, and that will cause your cells to explode. So this little diagram thingy that Chris Wright does is what I think actually quite works quite well. So basically your initial osmolarity is 300 and 300. When you give isosmolar, uh, when you give isosmolar urea, your extracellular blood doesn't really change because it's still about 300 and the concentrations for, or per liter is still quite the same. But because it's still be able to kind of move across, some of that urea will come across into your cells and that would become about 300. And because your cells are so small, it doesn't really change anything in your extracellular fluid, so it just comes across into 300. That means that your tonicity change is 300 in your inside, but you basically just injected the zero tonicity substance in your own cells, which means it goes from low tonicity to high tonicity, water will flow into your cells, and your cells will explode. That's the kind of conceptual idea of urea, and that is isosmolar, but it will not be used in a clinical setting because it will blow up your cells if given. Yep. Cool. Um, so some basic acid-base ideas. Um, these aren't super important at all because this is basically what the second year is about. Um, so there are a variety of buffering mechanisms in the body. One of the big ones is the bicarbonate carbon dioxide mechanism. Basically, you just breathe and you control some of your acid. Um, that's as far as I know is all you guys need to know about. Um, but the important pH numbers are important. So I lied, this is the second slide that I need you guys to know. Um, so blood pH is normally 7.4. Um, the accepted range is about 7.36 or 7.44, which is just 0.4 away from each other, um, from the normal. Neutral pH is 6.8, and this is due to the temperature of 37 degrees. So normally neutral is 7 because it's at 25 degrees, um, just some chemistry. Um, and so even though 7.2 is above neutral, um, and therefore kind of alkaline as a solution. It's still considered acidotic if it's in your body because it's lower 
than what your normal blood pH should be. And so if you are at 7.2, you are considered acidotic, not alkalonic, alkal alkalotic, because you are underneath your own normal pH. Does that make sense? Cool. No one responded, but anyway. Um, all right, so I have some questions for you guys, just because I had nothing else to fill my slides with. Um, but here we go. So a patient enters the ED severely dehydrated. Which solution could be given IV? I'll give you a quick sec. Um, people in the group chat can like just spam the group chat with your answers as well. That'd be funny. Um, but I guess if anyone has any questions, now's a good time to ask. Chuck up a hand. Um, likewise, with the people on chat. All right, David, we get it. Um, you're not even right. Um, so, <laughs> what if people pick A, put your hand up. People B, put your hand up. C, D, <laughs> E, cool, so it's A. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what David was doing. Um, <laughs> um, so, A is the right answer. B, C, and D are just the wrong numbers, so just remember the numbers. And then E, you never give it, so don't bother giving it. Um, okay, so red blood cell is placed in a solution and the red blood cell then lies. What could this solution be? I'll give you a quick second to think about this one. Um, all right, I think I have left on time. Um, for those who A, put your hand up. B, uh, C, and D. All right, so your answer is D, and I'll spend a time in a second if I talk about this. So basically the idea here is that you need to consider what your normal numbers are and then what's happened in terms of what you've changed it to. So a red blood cell is placed in a solution, the red blood cell then lies. This means the solution you injected in was hypotonic, uh, or hy yeah, hypotonic, causing water to flow into your cells. Does that make sense? If it's the solution you injected was hypotonic, it means it has to be below the normal value you've injected into your system. 0.9% is normal, 5% dextrose is also normal. 9% saline is more than 0.9% saline, and so therefore there's more osmols in that, which will therefore mean your water will move from inside your cell to outside the cell, causing your cells to coronate. 1% dextrose is lower than normal, so this is a hypotonic solution, and therefore will cause water to be pulled in, causing your cells to lie. One response. Um, okay, so a patient admits the ED with blood pH of 7.2. This is what? Um, so normal, neutral, acidotic, or alkaline. Um, I don't know if I'm getting A's or C's in the chat, but David still thinks it's saline. Um, <laughs> all right, for those A, put your hand up. B, C, D. Cool. Awesome, so even though technically um, it's an alkaline pH, it's still acidotic because it's in comparison to your body's, body's normal pH, and which is of uh, 7.4. Cool. All right, um, so a cell, not a red blood cell, has an osmolality of 600 millimoles per liter, of which these are all effective osmoles. When placed in a solution of 0.9% saline, what happens? I don't think this cell actually exists, by the way. I just needed a question, so fun. So I'm getting spams in chat. Do we have an answer or are we still thinking? Okay, so. A cell, this is this thing. People who picked A, put your hand up. B, put your hand up. C, put your hand up. D, put your hand up. Yeah, it was definitely D. Um, <laughs> so the answer is B because the solution you put in is now hypotonic. Um, and so because 0.9% saline is normally 300, 300 is hypotonic to 600, and so therefore your cell will burst or lies. Um, hopefully that makes sense to everyone. That's a bit different to what you guys normally get, but anyway. Does that make sense? Yes? 
group of the call chat people. I think that makes sense. Um, cool, all right. So enzymes, so just general information on enzymes. This is just basically biological catalysts. If you did U12 bio or even U12 chem, <laughs> this should all be like fairly okay. But um, basically they don't change the delta G, which is basically the same thing as delta H. I know it's not actually, but it's effectively the same thing. Um, and it lowers the activation energy, and it does it by three different ways. So either by orientation, so basically putting two things together in a certain way, either by physical strain, so this basically just means that they've pushed on the bits so it's under pressure, or by adding electrical charges onto them, so putting mine plus uh, positive or negative um, bits on them, which affects their bonding as well. Um, these both kind of lock and key model, um, but that's not super important or useful. So adjuncts to enzymes. So some enzymes require other molecules to function. Um, these are prosthetic groups, inorganic cofactors, or coenzymes. Prosthetic groups are uh, bound tightly and are inorganic. Inorganic factors are bound loosely. Coenzymes, these are organic non-protein molecules. Uh, these are non-protein permanently bound and are released um, with the reaction ending within between enzymes. Um, by the way, difference between post and pre-slides, post slides have answers on them. Um, enzymes that require a cofactor are called apoenzymes. If they don't have one, um, if they don't have one, they're called a Hollis enzyme if they do. Um, just as a terminology kind of thing. Um, these, you don't really have to know super well what the differences are between these. I asked Richard this last year and he was like, ah, uh, um, didn't get an answer. So that tells you how much you know about that. But basically there's three different types. So enzyme inhibition. So enzymes are controlled or affected through inhibition. Um, so feedback inhibition is the classic pathways, negative feedback, where the product of one reaction causes you to block the whole thing. So if A produces B and B produces C, C blocks A, which therefore means that you produce less of C later on if you have too much of C, and if you don't have enough of C, you produce more A, which produces more B, which produces more C. Make sense? This is another thing. Um, Okay, so this basically decreases your waste of energy and that kind of stuff. So there are, th there are a couple of types of inhibition, not three, I can't count. Um, competitive, non-competitive, uncompetitive, and allosteric. Um, and these are the four types. So competitive, this molecule will bind to the active site, um, which is different to all the other ones. So they'll bind literally directly on the active site. These can be reversible or irreversible. The reversible type is simply just broken by just adding more of the substrate you want. Um, it works off Le Chatelier's principle from year 12, if, that, if that's like triggering. Um, but it's basically that mechanism. Uncompetitive inhibition binds away from the active site and prevents the product from leaving the active site. So that's important. So it's, it's allowing the substrate to bind, but it doesn't allow the product to leave, um, locking it in. Non-competitive inhibition also binds away from the active site and changes the active site, preventing the subject from binding in the first place. So this basically just means the subject can't get in to begin with. Um, allosteric, allosteric inhibition or promotion, these are basically just sites on an enzyme which can either promote um, enzyme activity or inhibit enzyme activity. Um, and that's kind of all there is to inhibition. So questions. A stomach protease is put in a petri dish with some protein and placed in an incubator. What happens? Oh, there's a question. Yep. Um, so an enzyme won't do anything unless it has a substrate because it has nothing to act on. Allosteric inhibition or activation just means that either the enzyme will work or the enzyme won't work. So if it's activated, the enzyme will work if the substrate binds. If it's inhibited, the enzyme won't work when the substrate binds. So it's either turned on and off, basically, and then the substrate will bind and work. Make sense? Cool. Um, so people picked A, put your hand up. B, put your hand up. C, put your hand up. D, put your hand up. I didn't see many hands, but whatever. Um, so the answer is quite actually C. Um, and so enzymes, I guess I didn't really talk about it, but also have this other idea where they're specific to the environment they're found from. So if they're specific temperature, specific pHs, they're all at that specific pH. 
And this is because they're made out of proteins, and proteins have a specific structure that's because of their surroundings and environment, okay? So therefore, C, nothing really happens because either the protein doesn't even work to begin with or it's not activated in that solution. Um, it's not gonna be working down faster or slower. Um, it's just gonna be nothing happens, really. Cool, so cell signaling. Um, this is even lighter than the one beforehand, so here we go. So what happens, um, the signaling molecule binds receptor on the cell membrane. This binding causes the release of intracellular seeding cascades or secondary molecules, um, and this will prevent other pathways to occur. These intracellular signals reach an intracellular target and act on it. These can be um, proteins or they can be um, gene regulatory ideas causing your um, central dogma to do its thing. Uh, these can also have intracellular receptors, um, so it's slightly different to what the diagram here is showing. So instead of having your intracellular protein, your receptor being up here, instead it's kind of inside the cell and it will act on DNA more exactly. Um, that depends on the chemical and the nature of that hormone, um, which is not super relevant to you guys right now, but that's kind of just a fun fact. But cell signaling, that's how it works. Yep. Cool. Um, so there are a couple of different types of cell signaling. So these are contact dependent, synaptic, paracrine, endocrine, autocrine. So contact dependent literally means that cells have to touch each other. Um, so T cells and target cells, the T cell has to bind to the target cell for it to do anything. Um, synaptic, this is between one neuron and the next um, with a short synaptic junction in between where neurotransmitters would jump the gap. Um, this is a fast response, but it's a short lasting response because it's only kind of a burst of neurotransmitters out. Uh, paracrine, this is where the signal is transmitted into the surrounding environment affecting nearby cells. So paracrine is nearby, it kind of just spams its stuff into the opening solution and then, I don't know, if I threw like an enzyme into someone, it'll hit something. Um, that's kind of how it works. Uh, endocrine, this is where the signal is transmitted through the blood and affects cell far away. This is slower but longer lasting because you have to produce the hormone for a longer period of time. It also has a different kind of effect. Um, autocrine, this is where a signal will affect the same cell that secreted it, so basically it's affecting itself. Um, does that all make sense? Question? Um, what do you mean only chemical synapses? Um, they're synaptic. So, yeah, so the they're all synaptic. Between one neuron to the next neuron, they're synaptic. If your neuron's just spreading it into the environment, uh, like some of the neuromuscular junction, for instance, that you can consider maybe paracrine, but they're synaptic between one neuron to the next. Yep. Um, this is a picture that demonstrates it. Um, cool. All right, no questions there because there's nothing really for me to ask. <laughs> okay. So macromolecules, this is a kind of an introduction into what Karan will be talking about in the next hour, in half an hour, um, which means I have a lot of time to not do much. Um, but basically, these are the fundamental molecules that you'll be working with um, or thinking about in Karan's lecture. So I guess this is just the basics and an introduction almost. Um, so lipids, these are stored as triglycerols um, and composed of a glycerol body um, and three fatty acids. That's not super important, but I guess it's kind of what it is. So it's stored in adipose tissue. Um, that's kind of important just purely because of metabolic, metabolic actions later in terms of where it comes from, where does it go, or where does it stored. Um, these are used in beta oxidation and ketone formation. Beta oxidation is your normal um, energy production method where it's actually used quite a lot, especially at rest for you guys um, right now sitting there. Um, and ketones um, are for when you're starving or when you're diabetic um, and you can't um, produce enough glucose, so ketones will be happening. Um, these are produced through dietary intake and are initially in the lymphatic system, so they're absorbed initially through your lacteals um, in your small intestine. Um, and there are also other lipid forms. So these are phospholipids and cholesterol. Phospholipids you should hopefully be quite familiar with, they're for your cell membranes. Cholesterol, these are useful hormones, um, most specifically, but also for retaining cell membrane rigidity. These are not used for energy, um, critically. So phospholipids and cholesterol, there's no energy pathways for them because they're not used for energy. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Carbohydrates. So these are stored as glycogen in the muscles in the liver. The muscles in the liver are also the only places where it's really stored. Um, the liver has a big store of it, and the muscles have its own personal store, which means when you're starving, your liver will produce it for the whole rest of the body. Um, your muscles will just produce it for itself. 
um, and hopefully this is familiar because of a glycogen 6-phosphate enzyme. Um, this is broken down to glucose when digested, and there are quite different forms, so monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Um, you don't really have to know the names of all these different ones, just know that they exist. So monosaccharides are just one monomer, disaccharides are two monomers connected together, and polysaccharides are many. Um, these are used in glycolysis, which then goes to the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, which Quran hopefully will be talking about later. Cool. I'm not lying then. Um, okay, so proteins. So these make up most structures in your body. And I mean literally most, like basically everything's a protein, even if you don't think it is. Um, these are made up of amino acids. They're not really used as an energy source unless you're starving. Um, and then in that case, they're broken down and the skeleton, carbon skeleton is used or, um, and converted into either glucogenic or ketogenic processes. So glucogenic just means they're chucked into the glucose pathways and ketogenic just means they're chucked into the ketone kind of pathway. Um, and this depends on specific amino acids. The specifics, don't know, you don't need to know them, um, just know whether they can, the carbon skeleton can be used to be broken down. I imagine they'll be talking about a bit more later, but basically the, the, uh, uh, the nitrogen group kind of thing gets ripped off, and um, that's where your urea comes from, and then the rest of it becomes used in your multiple meta metabolic pathways. Um, there are four protein structures, um, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Primary is just a chain of amino acids. Secondary is um, their folds, so they're either beta pleated sheets or alpha helices or loops. Um, and tertiary structures, these are 3D structures formed by folding. And then quaternary structures, just a whole bunch of different proteins chucked together. So your hemoglobin is a quaternary structure because it's made up of four different proteins. Um, the rest is just your normal proteins and your own enzymes. Yep. Um, this isn't super important, but it's kind of the idea that fats produce your most energy per molecule, per gram. And that's why it's used a lot for your base rate metabolic um, processes. Um, Alcohol is actually also quite high in energy, just as a fun fact, really. Um, but the reason it's not used or that important is because it's got that toxic um, intermediate pathway, which means it will kill you if you do too much of it. Haha, <laughs> medball. Um, um, other molecules, not macromolecules. So these are electron carriers. So this includes NADH, FADH2, and NADPH. NADH and FADH2 are the most important of these trio, NADPH is just used for like this other random, the pentose pathway thing, um, which isn't super important, but it's there, I guess. Um, of these, NADH and FAD, yeah, like I said, um, these are used in metabolic reactions to produce ATP. Um, effectively, all these are, they carry around hydrogens for the electron transport chain. And that's effectively all they really need to do. Um, ATP is the energy that we use to store. Um, these can be used in reactions such as phosphorylation to kind of release that third bond and release the energy stored in them. Um, all right, some questions. So what level of protein structure is hemoglobin? Just yell out the answer to this one. D, cool. Um, quaternary, I think I told you in the thing. Um, okay, so applied metabolism. So this is important. Um, they give you a couple of questions of these every year. Last year, the revision lecturer made them out to be a lot more like tricky than they Feel like, feel like they are. Um, faculty doesn't really like make it too nitpicky for you guys, I don't think. Um, but basically, the idea is to know when you're going to be using the major processes and the ideas behind specific kind of question types, really. Um, these are important. You'll get a couple of questions on these for sure. Um, but don't get too caught up if it's like glycogenolysis that's going on or if it's like a specific thing that's going on at a specific time because they're not going to be that vague with you guys. They'll be quite more specific. Um, but anyway, we'll get started. So general terminology. Um, so isis, so glycogenolysis um, indicates breakdown of something. Um, inesis indicates synthesis of something. So um, uh, I don't know, glycogen Genesis, in the synthesis. Um, and A is ASE, in the an enzyme. So lipase is an enzyme for lipids. Um, so this is just some general terminology to help you guys remember stuff so you're not just kind of confused um, going forward. Okay, so different metabolic needs. So basically, all different cells in your body will require different kinds of proteins or fuels. Um, this is partially because your different cells have different organelles in them and have different needs for that energy. Um, so for instance, your red blood cells, they have literally nothing in them. So they can't undergo most of the metabolic pathways you guys have been learning about because they don't have the mitochondria to do it. Um, 
it's also just an important concept um, for general in terms of your histolo histology as well, in terms of um, that cell will have organelles based upon its function. So if you kind of know its function, it'll help you out a little bit. Um, cells in different areas will also use different molecules at different times of metabolic stress. All that means is that if your one cell is in a starving condition, it might do something different to when it's not starving, which kind of makes sense. Um, okay, so we'll start off with skeletal muscle. So this uses a lot of energy. It's about 20% of oxygen during rest, but 90% during exercise, and can use all the different kinds of fuel sources because your muscles need to be able to produce a lot of energy for it to do anything and for it to move anywhere. Um, and so therefore, you have a lot of skeletal muscle going on. Okay, so basically you need to know what these kind of energy types are gonna be using at different kind of time points. So at rest, they'll be using fatty acids because that's your basal kind of metabolic um, energy usage. Um, just as a funny story, I guess you guys might find interesting to see how I remember this. Um, I was on the bus once and these like two girls were sitting there like talking and they were like, do you know that you, you, you burn more fat sitting down than you do like exercising? And I was like in my own head. Yeah, you kind of do, but like you also just don't spend that much energy sitting down to begin with, so not really. But anyway, hopefully that kind of reminds you of something and it's like not super useless and I haven't just like added myself as a stalker. Um, but basically at rest, your body will muscles will use fatty acids um, and be supplemented by blood glucose and ketones. Um, but when you're moderately active, your body will start breaking down glucose um, in its intrinsic glycogen stores. Um, and it's intrinsic because it's the this is GX6P, glycogen 6-phosphate, um, because it doesn't have the energy or the requirements to convert it into glucose. Um, when it's extremely active, your body will still use glucose, but it will undergo anaerobic respiration instead, producing lactic acid or lactate. That lactate will go through the rest of your pathways um, to be converted back into glucose, which I hope Quran will also be talking about. Um, when you're starving, you use proteins to break down to amino acids. Um, these undergo glucogenesis or, glucogenesis or ketogenesis later on. And then when you're using short bursts of energy, so when you're, this is like the key word for this is sprinting to anything, um, uses creatine phosphate or phosphocreate creatine. That's the same thing, they're just annoying with the words. Um, this is a fast one step reaction to release energy that's stored um, and only really exists in your muscles. All right, so your heart. The heart can't undergo anaerobic uh, respiration, and that's important because it means when you have um, ischemic events, i.e. your coronary arteries are blocked because, I don't know, you like macros too much. Um, this can be really damaging because it means your heart doesn't have an anaerobic process to keep itself alive. Um, and because it also doesn't have an internal energy source, it's basically just starving itself, and that will cause cells to die. And that's quite bad. So the idea primarily is that it uses fatty acids and it can't undergo anaerobic respiration. Those are the two key facts for the heart. Um, the brain, so critically, the brain only uses glucose and undergoes the aerobic pathway. And this is because lipids can't cross the blood-brain barrier, which isn't a super important thing to know in terms of what it can't cross, but that's the reason. Um, during starvation, the brain can also use ketones. Um, this is to maintain blood glucose levels and as a way to kind of slow the process down of you just dying because you have not enough glucose in your system. This is why diabetics occur. Um, um, okay, the chat's going nuts. But um, during starvation, you have used ketones going forward. The brain has no internal energy stores either and thus needs a constant supply. Um, and so the other concept is that fatty acids are not used in um, brain metab metabolism. It can be kind of used in kind of proxy, by proxy, in terms of by converting fatty acids to ketones. And the ketones can be used in starvation conditions, but um, fatty acids are just generally used, or fatty acids are not used in the brain to begin with. Cool. Um, red blood cells, so I talked about this a little bit already. So these rely purely on glucose and then goes anaerobic respiration. Um, this undergoes the glycolytic pathways and the pentose phosphate pathway, but that's a minor thing. Um, this is because they have no organelles, like literally nothing. They don't even have a nucleus. Um, so therefore they can't do anything apart from just go through the anaerobic path respiration. Um, this means that they have the highest glucose utilization because they can only use glucose and do so inefficiently. Um, 
adipose tissue. So generally, all they really do is store triglycerides. Um, after meal, triglycerides are delivered here to adipose tissue via chylomicrons and are stored there. Um, in between meals, the triglycerides are mobilized, i.e. they're taken out of the adipose tissue um, due to hormones um, triggering it. And they act upon lipase and they're mobilized onto albumin, which is the protein thing that carries many things around, but one of them is lipids. Um, the glycerol just enters the bloodstream and gets converted into through glycogenolysis into new things. Oh, glucogenesis, sorry, into new things. Oh, into glucose. Um, all right, so the chat's been eagerly awaiting this. Um, the great metabolic race. Um, so this is a symbolic of how energy is used um, rather than really of a race. It's more so, well, it is a race as well, but it's more so just to indicate after the start, when you start doing things, you start um, burning more carbohydrates con con uh, comparatively, but over time, your fats kind of keep up and come back. Um, that's kind of the key ideas of this. So during rest, the energy comes from primarily fatty acids, as it is an efficient fuel source and produces a lot of energy for per gram at use. Um, at the very start of exercise, creatine phosphate is used to give a quick source of energy. Um, and this in a question will be termed as a sprint. So if you're sprinting for something, creatine phosphate is used um, primarily there. So it's a short sprint. Um, after the first two minutes, there's a reliance on the anaerobic pathway as the heart catches up. So basically, the start of exercise, you're going to be undergoing anaerobic because your heart's not pumping fast enough to kind of deliver that oxygen throughout your whole body. Um, and therefore, you're going to be going to anaerobic respiration to begin with. Um, during the second to the third, fifth minute, there's a heavy reliance on glucose and glycogen. And at five minutes, there's a peak for carbohydrate usage. Um, carbohydrates use the start because the metabolic process is faster. Um, and then from five to 30 minutes, the reliance kind of flips back down. Uh, where fatty acids catch up because it's just kind of keeping up metabolic needs um, as it goes through, and this is kind of the pathway picture. After, fatty, after 30 minutes, it kind of just flips over. Um, this is a, a graph of the percentage of energy supplied, not total energy supplied. So in reality, all of these kind of fat energy usage and carbohydrate usage is probably coming higher. It's just that in comparison, the amount of energy or where the energy comes from is going to be higher for all carbohydrates at five minutes than it is going to be for fats in terms of the percentage of where your total energy comes from rather than your total energy. So that will come up in a question. So if it doesn't make sense, I'll explain it there as well. All right, so metabolic load on glucose. So during different times, the main source of glucose will change. Um, and it's important for you guys not to get these two things mixed up. So this one and the one before it, I can't flip between them super fast, so I'm not going to. But um, this picture here, um, where it's the sources of blood glucose and the great metabolic race picture, Try not to get them mixed up because it's not so much talking about where energy is coming from. This is talking about where the blood glucose will come from in your body. So directly after a meal, the majority of blood glucose will come from that meal. And that's what dietary intake is. And that's that purple line on that graph. Um, this is a really quick spike, but it's also really quick to come deck down because of glyco, um, glycogen production. Um, as time passes, your glycogen will start being broken down um, as it uses to maintain your blood glucose levels, so glycogenolysis. Um, on a general outlook, fatty acids are also being mainly used, but this is a different graph to the one previous, and so I want you guys to kind of think about these kind of two things separately rather than as a combined entity, because typically they won't ask you mixed. Um, as even more time passes, and this is typically when you're sleeping or you're fasting, glucogen, glucogen, glu gluconeogenesis will start to occur and maintain blood glucose levels. Um, and this is just because you have no other source to kind of break it down from. Does that all make sense? Because now we're just going to go into questions until end of time. Um, okay, I have a question from the chat. So gluconeogenesis is just kind of the idea of it happens and it starts happening after a long time of starvation. It's not really going to be a specific time. I've said four hours, that's what the graph shows it to be. But in reality, it's more so just if you're starving or if you're fasting for a long period of time, you're going to be start clicking to gluconeogenesis purely because your body doesn't have enough glucose rather than at a specific time. Um, that question wasn't even from the room, but it was from the chat. But does that make sense, everyone? I've got no responses, but okay. I'm going to assume yes. Um, so are there any other questions? No? No? Okay. Um, okay, so during rest, what's the major fuel source for the heart? 
All right, so everyone who's A, put your hand up. B, put your hand up. C, put your hand up. D, put your hand up. Cool. So the answer was B, fatty acids. Um, triglycerides is what they're stored as, so watch out for that, I guess. Um, so there's been an ischemic incident. Which of the following issue types are the worst affected if the ischemic event occurred there? Um, there are two correct answers, so don't get too confused and mad at me. Um, have a think. Have a quick think. All right, so everyone who picks A, put their hand up. B, put their hand up or keep your hand up. C, put your hand up or keep your hand up. And then D, put your hand up or keep your hand up. All right, so the advantages are A and B, um, both because they don't have their own fuel sources. The heart is your typical one, so if it's a buzzwordy kind of thing, heart muscle is your typical one because it doesn't have, it, it doesn't, it can't undergo anaerobic respiration, so therefore it's the only thing that it can do. Um, C is wrong because even though it probably won't be good, your, your muscles can at least survive for a little bit um, under anaerobic conditions. And your red blood cells, you can't really occlude your red blood cells from blood because it is blood. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, so I got a bit bored writing my question, so this is where this comes from. Um, so you and your friends have entered active learning and realized that there is only one seat left in 2 p.m. Friday active learning. Both of you are definitely group B, definitely. Um, which energy source is used when you both sprint for that seat? Okay, so A, put your hand up. B, put your hand up. C, put your hand up. D, put your hand up. Cool. So the answer is D. Um, I saw a few hands for B, um, but the reason, I guess, B, B, I would say, is not the best answer rather than being technically the wrong answer. You would probably have some glucose being produced anaerobically, but in an exam situation, if it's a sprint, pick creatine phosphate, um, every day, unless there's some reason they don't have creatine phosphate for some reason. Um, okay, so you never were a fast runner, and you missed out on the seat, and you kicked out, sad face. It is now 6 p.m., and you are starving. What source are your glucose going to be coming from? Um, there are technically two answers, but that's fun. Um, okay, so let's pick A, put your hand up. B, put your hand up. C, put your hand up. D, put your hand up. Well, okay, D was a troll, so I mean, technically, C is always wrong. Um, so the answer here is C rather than B, just because it hasn't been super long. I guess typically they'll tell you when you last ate. Um, so I guess that's my bad. Sorry. But generally at 6 p.m., you're not really considered yourself as starving. Glucodeneogenesis only really occurs if you're being told they're starving or you're told they just woke up from sleep or if you're told they've been fasting, okay? So there's a couple of key words for gluconeogenesis, fasting, um, starving, or sleeping, um, those kind of things. Um, or just in a kind of like logical sense of like they've like had a long, 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 long time without food. Glycogenolysis is just decent chunk of time before after they've had food, right? So therefore, it's not really an either extreme of the symptom or the case. Um, okay, so you vowed to never let this happen again and decided to start running and are, you need a referral to a psychiatrist. Um, you've been going for 15 minutes. What's your primary fuel source? Um, so spice is not the right answer. Um, so B, put your hand up. C, put your hand up. D, put your hand up. Cool. So your answer is B, um, to carbohydrates. You haven't really clicked into that method where you're losing more fatty acids, um, and so you're losing more carbohydrates to begin with. Yep. Yep. Yeah, then that's right too. That's definitely right. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, all right, so my bad. Starving's probably not the right word choice. I was more bored in saying starving is like you're really hungry. Um, that's my bad. Um, that snack you ate at blah, 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 blah times, that would be an answer, yes, because it's dietary intake of glucose. Um, and so that's the right answer as well. But the idea is more conceptually is that you are not in the phase where it's starvation, right? It's not so much you're hungry, it's more so you're literally starving. And that's where gluconeogenesis typically occurs. Yep. Yeah, um, when I'm saying starving this question, I don't mean starving, starving. I mean like you're really hungry. That's my bad in terms of word choice. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, it's also my bad in terms of like when you've like out eight. Glyco okay, so gluconeogenesis, pick that as an answer if you're literally starving in the exam, in terms, or if you're fasting, as in you haven't eaten for a very, very long time. Okay, so no, you don't really produce ketones that fast. So ketones really only happen when you're really, really about to die. Like, not gonna lie, that's like diabetes. You're about to die, that's when your body starts producing ketones, right? There's always a little bit, but not when it's a primary fuel source. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? So that's like my bad in terms of question writing. Um, but does that make sense? Cool. Um, okay, so once you're, you start exercise, your fatty acid usage drops, true or false? Um, a, put your hand up. B, put your hand up. Okay, so it's false. So like even though technically your percentage drops, your total energy usage doesn't drop. Right? Um, this is what I was talking about earlier. Your total percentage of how much energy, total amount of energy you're using doesn't fall. The percentage of how much of your total energy output is produced from fatty acids falls because your whole metabolic is going up. Does that make sense? Kind of a trick question, but I got bored. Yep. Yep. So basically, the graph, if I was to draw a graph of how much energy you're using, would it be going up? Right, because you're exercising, you have more energy usage. So therefore, your total energy isn't gonna fall because your energy is still going up. The proportion of that energy contributed by either fatty acids or by glucose will fall, as in your carbohydrates, um, your fatty acids will fall in terms of the percentage of the total amount rather than as a number. Does that make sense? Question, oh, is that a question? No, diagrams, cool. All right, um, and last question. You have jumped to the pool and realized you can't actually swim. I don't know how that happened. But which of these cells are least likely to have a metabolic consequence? All right, so A, put your hand up. B, put your hand up. C, put your hand up. And D, put your hand up. Cool. So your answer is D. Um, what I mean by metabolic consequence is that producing no energy. Um, so heart muscle will die, brain will die, your skeletal muscle will struggle, but your red blood cells won't really do anything because they don't need oxygen anyway. Right? So therefore, then nothing will really happen to them. Um, but cool. So I finished about five minutes early, which I think is okay. Because um, I had nothing really to talk about. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me now. Um, people in the chat, feel free to ask me now. If you don't feel comfortable asking me questions in person or in this kind of group format, send me a message on Facebook. Um, but yeah, if you have any other questions, have a look at PSP slides. I'll be honest, I put a lot more effort into that than I did to these slides. Um, but have a look at those. Um, good luck for your exams. Don't stress too much. Um, all that kind of gluconeogenesis things. And when they occur, don't stress too much about that because they won't ask you that specific question of them and they'll make it pretty obvious where it is, okay? Just remember the two pictures and you'll be okay. Um, this is your SEM 1 first exam. Don't stress is all I'm going to say. Um, thanks, guys. Do we want to take a five minute break and come back or do we want to just jump in? Five minutes? Yep.
Um, so we might just make a start so you guys can finish earlier. Um, someone online had a question about uh, one of the questions Kevin covered about uh, the proportion of fatty acids being used. Um, and although the absolute number increases, you still get a drop in fatty acid use because your other sources, your glycolysis, glyconeogenesis, they take over, especially during sprinting and high metabolic demand. So the proportion drops. But yeah, that was that. Um, so metabolism. So just a brief overview. Last year we had one fourth of our one third of our entire exam on metabolism. So that means your first exam would be about 60% metabolism and biochem. This should not be concerning, and I hope it won't after I'm done with this lecture. Um, but even if it is, I just want you to take away, what I want you to take, from, to take away from this are these really basic key concepts, which I think as long as you get, you should be fine for exams. Please do not stress about those citric acid cycles and those various intermediates. You do not need to know what alpha succinate does. Just know what the inputs are, what the outputs are, and we'll go through that. Yeah, if you don't know it, it's fine. Yeah. So this is an overview of metabolism. And this was included in one of our active learnings last year, and they thought this would be a great kind of overview to, for us to kind of realize. So we just reached out and... <laughs> and nothing good came of that. So please do not do this. It's really annoying. Um, so overview. So we're going to cover uh, a few definitions and then go through the different problems processes for digestion and catabolism for these uh, main energy sources, your carbs, your lipids, proteins, um, and also talk a bit about uh, alcohol, drug metabolism, and just very briefly, I have a few questions on the great metabolic race, because I feel that that's a lot of where they kind of apply these key concepts, for, especially for metabolism. So what is metabolism? I think that's a good start. So basically, metabolism are these series of chemical events which cause the breakdown of various dietary sources, produce energy. Sounds pretty simple. Um, it basically involves two basic processes. So you have your anabolism and catabolism. Anabolism is where you build stuff up. Catabolism is when you break stuff down. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and so metabolism isn't just breaking stuff down. Um, so you're going to see these terms like lysis, genesis, neogenesis. And it might seem quite confusing, especially which to me. Um, but I think as long as you focus on like the word and the different parts of it, you should be good. 
So things like glycolysis. So you have your glycol, which is your glucose. Lysis meaning breakdown, as you know. So glycolysis is a breakdown of your glucose, and we'll cover that a bit further. You have, you, you have your glycogenolysis, so that's the breakdown of your glycogen. You have your glycogenesis, genesis meaning creation, so it's your buildup of glycogen. And then you have things like gluconeogenesis. Gluco is your sugars. Neo means neogenesis means production. So it's the production of new sugars from other stuff. So some basics. ATP is the powerhouse of the cell. Um, and it's basically what is the main driver of all energy processes. So you have your highly charged ATP state, which has these phosphate groups, so adenosine triphosphate. Um, and that's your high energy. It often it results in the dissociation of one of those phosphate groups. Pew, pew, you have energy now. Um, so basically, if you talk about energy and food, a question which came to my mind was you have these tons of processes. You have your glycolysis, you have your citric acid cycle and whatnot. Why do we need these processes? So you need to realize that foods are very heavy in your energy stores. And when you're breaking them down, you're basically releasing, releasing a lot of energy. It's almost as if you're burning something, and that's the equivalent energy you release. You would not want to burn things in your body. So what you do is you have this step-by-step -step process where you gradually cleave off certain groups and build these high-energy molecules, so your ATPs, NADHs, FADHs, FADH2s, and these are then used to produce energy. So it's a very gradual onset. Um, so what you basically have, you have your fuel molecules being broken down into waste products, um, and then you have your ADP, which is your low energy state, being to, uh, um, transferred to a, your ATP or high energy state, which is then used for various metabolic processes. Um, so what is digestion and how is it different to metabolism? So digestion is simply the breakdown of your dietary intake. So if you have, let's say, complex carbohydrates and you break that down into glucose monomers, that's digestion. So you don't actually release any energy during digestion. You just break it down through your GI tract. Um, and that's basically so that your body can metabolize these byproducts later when they're absorbed and in the bloodstream. Yep. Um, this is something which was very briefly covered. We talked about starches. And um, starch is basically the main form of carbohydrates you, you take in. Um, and you have your unbranched um, starch forms and your moderately branched, so your amylose and your amylopectin. Your amylopectin is about 80% of all starch, but that's not really important. Um, what is important is to note that the branching of glucose, so you have your straight chains of glucose which branch via the alpha-1 bonds. Uh, what this 1 for means, it's basically the number of the, the position of the carbon atoms which are involved in, by, in, in this chain formation. So these numbers aren't like random completely. And then you have your tertiary branches, which come off, as you can see, like around here. So these branches actually contribute to the formation of amylopectin, which is slightly branched, and those are via the alpha-1,6. And you have, the, you have your different enzymes, your amylases, which are responsible for breaking these bonds down, which we'll cover. Um, you also have cellulose, which is indigestible, and it's metabolically inactive, so you basically pass it through your GI tract, and it's practically unchanged, and that's your roughage. So when people say you need to consume more fiber, that's your dietary fiber on cellulose. Um, okay, so we're going to talk a bit about how you basically break these carbohydrates down. So you start off in the mouth with your salivary amylase. A common question which comes up on exams is the process of digestion of carbohydrates starts in A, B, C, D, mouth, stomach, GI, and fourth option, which they just make up. And it's mouth, because you have your semi salivary alpha amylases, which act to break down those alpha-1,4 bonds, which we talked about earlier. Um, you also have other lipase, uh, other amylases, and that's within your pancreas and your epithelial cells, and they're all uh, kind of catered at specific branches. So you have your pancreatic amylases, which are at alpha-1,4, and also your epithelial amylases, which are not important at your alpha-1,6. Um, and what the end product of this in a broad sense is you want glucose because your GI tract and your gut cannot absorb these complex branch structures. You need to break it down to glucose, which then can cross the cell membrane and then move into your blood. If anyone has any questions, just raise your hand or stop me, please. Okay, so this is where everything starts to go to shit. Um, you have your glycolysis. Um, and I'm going to be, I'm trying to, I'm trying to go, try, trying to go as slowly as possible so you understand this as 
easily as you can because this is quite important and this does come up quite a bit. Um, so what is glycolysis? So we already said that you have already broken down your complex carbohydrates into glucose, it's been absorbed, and now you have glucose. So now basically what you need to do is you need to break this glucose down and the first step in this process is called glycolysis, glycolysis which is glycolysis, the breakdown of glucose. What it does is it produces two NADH and two ATP. Uh, we'll talk about that right here. So this the, often the question asked is which uh, metabolic process involves the preparatory and the payoff phase, and that's your glycolysis. Because you basically have the state where you need to first use ATP to produce ATP. Um, Sounds a bit counterintuitive, but in the grand scheme of things, you end up producing way more ATP and uh, energy to your NADH than you actually put in, so that's fine. Um, so you do not need to know these intermediates. Just please do not learn them. If you're super keen, I mean, I'm probably you know, that's not, me telling you it's not going to stop you anyway. Um, so you have your two ATP being used, and step one to four, are, those are your preparatory phase. So you basically prep um, glucose to all these intermediates, and then once that's done, you produce um, two NADHs and um, two ATPs at different points of time. So just going back, we produce two NADH and four ATP as total. However, we have to remember that two of those got used up in the preparatory phase. So the net production of glycolysis is you get, you put in one glucose, you get two pyruvates because pyruvate is a three carbon compound compared to glucose, which is a six carbon. So it makes sense for you to have two of them. And then you get two NADH and two ATP. This is important and this will come up in your exam. So just be mindful of that. Um, yep. Yeah. So they might often trick you in saying what are the outputs of glycolysis. Um, and if they mention four ATP, that's not technically wrong because you did have an input of two. So although the net is two, you still might get four as an answer. Um, yep, yeah, so as I mentioned before, you would need glycolysis so you don't spontaneously combust. And we will talk a bit more about these energy carriers, your NADH, your FADH2, NADPH, and what they really mean. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, so going back to your respirations, as Kevin mentioned, you have certain circumstances where you just can't respire aerobically. If you don't have enough oxygen, you still need energy. So what do you do? you undergo this process known as the anaerobic pathway. And what that basically involves is this process known as fermentation. So you have a breakdown of your pyruvate, which is a, which is a byproduct of your glycolysis. And that's converted into lactate or lactic acid. Um, this is important because this often comes up in questions around uh, prolonged exercise and eventual cramping because um, high levels of lactic acid cause muscle cramps. And this does not produce any ATP. Um, one of the common reasons why um, this actually takes place is because you need NAD plus because we already learned that during glycolysis you produce NADP, NADH from your NAD plus. So you need to have a certain level of NAD pluses within your cell for the process to keep going. If you don't do this, you basically run out of NAD plus and you're pretty screwed. Okay, so now you had your pyruvate, you had your glycolysis. What do we do now? We've only had two net ATP, which isn't really that much. I'm sure you've already been told that the net net output of your entire like, um, glucose breakdown is 32 ATP, and that's the number you want. You don't want two because no one needs two compared to 32. Um, and in order to keep that going, you basically need to um, chemically change pyruvate. And what you basically do is you undergo this process on this pyruvate decarboxylation, and it's pretty much what it says. So pyruvate decarboxylation means the reduction, like the removal of one carbon group. So as we said, um, your pyruvate is uh, a three carbon compound because you have two of them from a six carbon compound, which is your glucose. And then that gets reduced to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is something which will keep coming up time and again. Um, so I think it's important to understand how this thing happens. Um, you also produce one NADH and one CO2. And the CO2 is just the removed carbon from the pyruvate. Um, this also requires thymine. So a common question is in the absence of Thymine or a vitamin B1 deficiency, which of the following metabolic processes would be affected, and that's your pyruvate decarboxylation. Ah, everyone's favorite citric acid cycle. 
Um, you, for what, what I suggest you do for the citric acid cycle is just kind of realize what the various inputs are and what the outputs are. You do not need to know the various steps. Please do not do them. There's never going to be a question on them. And Janet McCauley just drilled that into us. Uh, do you guys still have Janet McCauley? No one has been to lectures? Okay. Um, okay, so we talked about how you have your pyruvate from your glycolysis. It's converted to your acetyl-CoA, which is a two-carbon compound, right? And it basically enters the citric acid at this, uh, the citric acid cycle at this point. So what it basically does is it combines with this compound known as ox oxaloacetate, which is a four-carbon compound. So four plus two, you get citrate. Again, um, the only reason I'm mentioning these terms is so you understand how you actually how the acetyl-CoA enters the cycle without um, kind of producing anything else as a side product. Um, so your oxaloacetate and your acetyl-CoA joined form something else, and that basically undergoes tons of steps, and you have the release of uh, three NADHs at these various steps here, one, two, three NADHs. Um, you also have one FADH and one ATP. Um, important to realize is that this is per molecule of acetyl-CoA. It is not per molecule of glucose. So a common question which comes up is, what are the outputs of, a citric, of the citric acid cycle per molecule of glucose? So you just got to multiply that by two because you have two power weights for every glucose. Yep, does that make sense? One ATP, one FADH2, and two CO2. Um, yep, so you basically multiply this by two. And this is where most of the energy and most of the electron carriers are released. So you have a lot of uh, kind of high energy molecules being released at this point. Um, it's important to realize that the only things your body can use immediately are your ATPs. So your NADHs, your FADH2s aren't really um, capable of being used for various life processes unless they enter the uh, electron transport chain, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, okay, so what did we have till now? So just going back, we had one glucose, entered the glycolysis pathway, you have two pyruvates, you had four ATPs as a whole, two from glycolysis, two from the Krebs cycle, or the citric acid cycle. Yep. So you, because um, technically there would be inputs, but so obviously if you're having these removed, you basically have your NAD pluses joining and being converted. So it's more of a conversion than an input, but for example, purposes, they won't really ask that. Uh, what they're basically concerned with is the kind of carbon compounds which go in and the carbon compounds which come out. Um, yep, you also have your two FADH2s and your six CO2s, which makes sense because your, gly because your glucose is a six carbon compound. So if you break it down eventually, you go back to that six CO2 and water molecule um, equation. So we have what is this, what is NADH, FADH2, and NADPH. And I'm sure you've been told that one NADH equates to somewhat about 2.5 um, molecules of ATP. And we're going to basically talk a bit about why we get this number, where this number is from, and why it's different to FADH2. Um, so this is your electron transport chain. So once you've had all your processes, you have your glycolysis, you have, you've had your Krebs cycle, um, all these intermediates or your electron carriers, your NADH, your FADH2, they enter the electron transport chain. What this process basically entails, you have your various catalysts and your factors, you have your NADH, Q reductase, ubiquinone. You do not need to know this. Um, what you do need to know is that uh, what basically happens at this inner mitochondrial membrane is that the NADH gets transferred back to its low energy NAD plus form. And during this process, it uses that energy to pump hydrogen across the membrane. Does that make sense? Because that's really important. So what you basically have is you have this active transport of hydrogen across the membrane. And that keeps happening across the electron transport chain um, with these various seductase proteins. And you have this high concentration of intermembranous um, hydrogen. Why is that important? Um, because you have this ADP synthase protein. Um, and what that basically does is it uses that, that high hydrogen concentration gradient to basically produce ATP. So this is where it all comes together. So you have your NADHs and FADH2s, which are practically of zero value up till this very point, where they create that gradient, and that gradient then produces ATP. 
So quick recap. So you have your glucose, glycolysis, pyruvate. If it's aerobic respiration, that gets converted and enters the citric acid cycle and then the electron transport chain. If it's anaerobic, it undergoes fermentation to form lactic acid. So this is a quick table which I found to be quite useful when I was going through this. And we're going to get to that number 32, I promise. Um, so for your glycolysis, we said we have two NADHs. We have two ATP. That's not to be confused with the four ATP produced and the two used. Your pyruvate decarboxylation, so your conversion of your pyruvate to your acetyl-CoA, which is one NADH. And for glucose, that's times two because you have two pyruvates per glucose. And then these are all the citric acid stuff. Multiply that by two. And we talked about this number, 2.5. Um, so the reason why it's different for FADH2 and NADH, it's not, it, this wasn't something which is really covered, but um, on asking and really pestering a lot of the professors, what they said was um, NADH is basically a more efficient kind of active transporter. So the energy produced from um, NADH can actually pump more hydrogen across that surface. So you establish a higher concentration gradient if it was only NADH compared to FADH2. So when that comes back to producing that ATP, you get more ATP from NADH than FADH2. Um, a lot of textbooks mention this number as 3 instead of 2.5 and 2 instead of 1.5. And the reason that is, uh, theoretically, it should be 3 and 2. However, because of certain insufficiencies within the electron transport chain, it gets reduced to 2.5 and 1.5. Um, so just multiplying those numbers and adding it up, you get 5, to so you can add them up, and you get, wow, you get 32 ATP. And a lot of textbooks use 32 to 36. And that's, again, just going back to the difference in this 2.5 versus 3. So if you put in 3, you get a different number. And so you have a bit of a range depending on how effective that electron transport chain is. Um, yep. And you, yep. So you get slightly different energy yields in different cells, but the overall consensus is that it's about 32 to 36. Um, this is, again, slightly important because they often ask where these various processes take place. And it's important to know that your glycolysis takes place within the cytoplasm. So even whether it's a eukaryote or a prokaryote, yes, which take place there. Uh, the processes involving your mitochondria um, are your pyruvate decarboxylation, your citric acid, and your electron transport chain. So because all these processes involve the pumping of hydrogen ions or the production of certain um, substrates using certain enzymes, you do need a mitochondrial matrix, and that's your mitochondria at the powerhouse of the cell thing, because that's where most of the high energy stuff takes place. Your glycolysis is pretty menial as compared to the others. Okay, so that was carbohydrate metabolism. Does anyone have any questions for that before I move along? Nope? Okay, cool. Um, so you're moving on to your lipids. So your lipids are primarily your dietary triglycerides. Um, and triglycerides just means you have tri, acyl, and then you have your glycerol backbone, your three fatty acids and your glycerol backbone, which we'll talk about. Um, and this can't directly be acted upon by lipases. What your lipases are, there are certain enzymes secreted by your pancreas to break down your triglycerols and your TAGs to simpler fatty acids and glycerol. However, they can't, this can't take place because fatty acids are hydrophobic. So what that means is in a solution, they clump together. And for any enzyme to act upon a substance, it needs to be on its surface. So what we basically do is we have these emulsifying factors. And for us, that's bile, which is produced by your liver. Um, and what it basically does is it forms these little tiny globules or missiles, um, and that's coated by bile salts. And once it's coated, you have an increased surface area for the action of these lipases, which then break them down to your um, fatty acids and your glycerol. Um, okay, so this is a question which comes up quite a bit um, about lipid digestion your and your transport. Um, so you talk about all these different stuff known as VLDLs, LDLs, HDLs, and your lipoproteins. Uh, we'll come to that a bit later. Um, but it's important to know that these are basically done um, through these things known as lipoproteins, which coat these fatty acids and help transport them in the bloodstream. Because obviously your fat is lipo uh, hydrophobic and you can't just suspend fat in your blood. Um, 
Yep. So once your once you have your fatty acids being broken down by all your lipases, they need to be broken down further into your fatty acyl CoA's, and that's very similar to your acetyl CoA um, in your carbohydrate metabolism. And this is done through a process known as beta oxidation. What beta oxidation basically means in very simple terms is it basically breaks the fatty, long fatty acid chain into smaller components and each one of those components is then converted. So you have two carbon segments successively cleaved off and they produce acetyl-CoA and as I said before, the acetyl-CoA is quite important because that feeds back into that citric acid cycle and electron transport chain. Um, it also generates one NADH and FADH2, um, which is moderately important. Um, so just here's a visual diagram if that helps you. Um, you have a CoA group attaching to the terminal end, and then you have an enzymatic reaction which cleaves this off, and then you do basically do the same thing until you have these uh, two carbon structures or your fatty acyl CoA's. Um, so if you remember your glycerol, glycerol uh, backbone, and we basically try to get the most out of everything we do. So what we basically do with the glycerol backbone is we convert it into dihydroxyacetyl phosphate, and it's a very big sounding word for what it is. It's basically one of the intermediates in the glycolysis pathway. So instead of starting from glucose and then moving all the way down, you can just start at one of the intermediate steps and eventually get to the end of glycolysis as you would with normal glucose. And then eventually that becomes pyruvate to enter the citric acid cycle. Yep. It is. So gluconeogenesis, that was, yep. So when I say gluconeogenesis, it's basically the production of glucose. Um, so certain cells can use that intermediate within the uh, glycolysis pathway. However, some other cells need there to be glucose for the glycolysis pathway to be initiated. So you might do the extra step of converting that intermediate again back to glucose and then starting again. So gluconeogenesis is basically the production of glucose, right? And what I said about it entering the glycolysis pathway, the reason we want glucose is for, for it to enter the glycolysis pathway, right? So you can either do that by entering midway through an intermediate or forming glucose and then entering. Yep. So certain cells for energy purposes might just use the intermediate. However, some other cells which need glucose for their survival, they might do the extra step of converting that intermediate back to glucose and then starting all over again. Um, you also have these ketone bodies, um, so your normal acetyl-CoA from your beta-oxidation enters the citric acid cycle. However, under certain circumstances, your acetyl-CoA might also be converted to your ketone bodies. And if you, any one of you have heard about the keto diet, that's basically what it is to a certain degree. Uh, you limit your uh, glucose intake to the level where you switch over and then you have a high level of ketone bodies and you might risk being in uh, ketoacidosis, which You'll cover more in second year, which is not good. Um, also, your ketones are, can be used for your heart, your brain, kidneys, and skeletal muscle. So anything which has mitochondria in them. Um, you cannot use ketones in your RBCs because they do not have mitochondria. And an important thing to know about RBCs is uh, your red blood cells. Is the, reason, the only reason they can use only glycolysis is because you don't want them to use oxygen because they are carrying oxygen. So it will be really counterintuitive if they end up using the oxygen they were meant to carry in the first place. Um, and for your protein catabolism, it's again really simple. You have your amino acids um, and you have this amine group. What this basically does is you remove that amine group and transfer it onto this process, into, onto the substrate known as alpha ketoglutrate. This is not really important. Um, what you do need to know is that this eventually goes up to the liver and you have your deamination, which is the opposite of the same process. Um, it also produces ammonia, which is a toxic byproduct, and you need to get rid of it, and that's done but through the urea cycle, which eventually produces urea, and that is excreted through your um, kidneys through pee. Um, and it basically produces NADH, uh, which, is, which then enters the um, electron transport chain. Um, so again, this is just a diagram of what I mentioned. You have your amino acids being converted into alpha keto acids. Um, and that basically is reversed in your liver. And when that happens is you produce NADH. Yep, is that clear? Anyone have any questions? No? 
Okay, so I mentioned urea cycle earlier. So as you know, your ammonium is toxic and it must be converted into a slightly more water-soluble stable form, and that's your urea. So this happens in the liver, and it's converted into this substrate known as carbamyl phosphate, which you do not need to know. What you do need to know is that it does require 2 ADP um, for the conversion, and it's in, this, in the greater sense, although you are releasing energy, you do need to get rid of this ammonia, so it's not really a choice. Um, so you, I did mention if you go back and have a look at your amino acid, you do have a carbon, and what you do want is to use this carbon as well. So you convert that into, um, basically, you, it undergoes gluconeogenesis and, and, and enters the citric acid cycle. So you have two types of amino acids. You have your glucogenic amino acids and your ketogenic amino acids. And what that basically indicates is what would happen to the carbon so with your glucogenic amino acids, it would undergo gluconeogenesis. And with your ketogenic amino acids, it would undergo ketogenesis. Yep. Yep. Okay. So transamination is basically the transfer. So with your amino acids, you have this amine group. Yep. So transamination is basically transferring of this amino acid group to your alpha ketoglutrate. So once you convert this, you end up with an alpha keto acid, which is whatever's left of your amino acid, and your glutamate, which is now your alpha keto glutate with an amine group. This is transamination. This then circulates through your blood, enters the liver, where it undergoes deamination, where that glutamate is converted back into alpha keto glutate and releases that amine group. So think of it as a loading, unloading process in regards to this alpha keto glutate. So wherever you need amino acid breakdown, this gets used and takes up this amine group, and in your liver, it then offloads that amine group. Yep. So it's basically, you don't really use much of it. It is an intermediate in the citric acid cycle, um, and you have have certain circulatory levels of alpha ketoglutrate in your blood, and that's just as a kind of a transport mechanism for your amines. So you have certain uh, alpha ketoglutrates for your citric acid cycle, and those are within your mitochondria because that's where it happens. And then you also have certain levels of blood alpha ketoglutrates for your amino acid transport. Yep. Um, so as I said, you might undergo gluconeogenesis or ketogenesis depending on the particular amino acids. You have 20 amino acids. Um, you don't need to know which one's which. Uh, just know that some undergo gluconeogenesis and some undergo ketogenesis. Okay, so I have a few questions for that. Um, we talked about salivary amylase. So what type of bonds are usually hydrolyzed by your salivary amylase? So hands up for A, B, C, D, E. Yep. So you have your alpha 1,4 bonds. If you think of um, amylose and amylopectin, your alpha-1,4 are your straight chain bonds, and those are the ones broken down by salivary amylase. The alpha-1,6 bonds are broken down in your intestines through intestinal amylases, and your beta-1,6 bonds are within your dietary fiber and are not broken down. So if you say beta, it's probably not going to be broken down. Okay, so which process has both a preparatory phase and a payoff phase? should be pretty simple. Hands up for A. B. C. Yep. D. Good stuff. Okay, so we talked about how you would break down glucose if you had some, and you need to realize that you obviously do not have high levels of glucose throughout the day. You have food, and that's where the most of your glucose comes from. However, you need glucose throughout the day. So the way we deal with that is we convert it to glycogen, and glycogen is highly branched, unlike starch, and it's stored within your muscles and within your liver, and this is basically like an energy reserve. So whenever your blood glucose drops, you have glycolysis. Um, and that's coming back to the great metabolic craze pathway thing. So if your blood glucose is low, you have glycolysis. And that releases glucose to maintain that level of uh, glucose in your blood which you need. And uh, issues with this are related to diabetes, but you don't need to know that. Um, it's important to know that gly glycogen is stored in the liver and skeletal muscles. So that's really important. 
as I said, glycogen is mobilized in the state of starvation to maintain blood glucose levels. Um, it's also closely regulated by insulin and glucagon. So just talking about these two hormones, insulin basically is secreted when you have a meal and you have high levels of blood glucose, and that converts your glucose into your glycogen. Make sense? And then when you are already, you haven't eaten for, some, for quite a while, and then you need those glucose stores back, you release glucagon, which is also by the pancreas. And what that does is that triggers the reverse of the process, so you get glucose from glycogen. Yep, does that make sense? Yep. So, which process is this, sorry? Yep. Yep, so any metabolic process would have tons of intermediates, as always, and um, glycogen to glucose, it does, it does involve uh, phosphorylation, so you get glycogen phosphate, glycogen 6-phosphate, and that's eventually broken down. Um, but I, you very unlikely that you would get a question on um, the intermediates. Um, so as I said, you get glucose 6-phosphate, glucose 1-phosphate uh, is glucose 6, um, and then that basically enters your uh, glycolysis pathway and eventually your citric acid cycle. Um, okay, so gluconeogenesis, so as I mentioned, this is the reproduction of your glucose when you don't have any, and that's, that usually takes place when your uh, glycogen stores have been depleted. So you have a meal, you have tons of glucose, you convert all that glucose onto glycogen, Throughout the day, your glycogen stores are released from your liver and your skeletal muscle. But when you run out of this glycogen, you still need that glucose. So what you do, you now switch to something known as gluconeogenesis, which uses other primary substrates to get glucose. And what that basically does is it pretty much glycolysis in, revert, in, in reverse. So you have your acetyl-CoA's, and then those get converted into your pyruvate, and you undergo a, a kind of a reverse reaction. Um, so for the second half of glycolysis, there are a few other intermediates. It's not exactly the same because some of those uh, intermediates aren't reversible. Um, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, it's glycolysis in reverse. Um, yeah, you also have like oxaloacetate intermediates, uh, but those aren't really important. Um, yep, yeah, so as I said, glycogen lysis, breakdown of your glycogen. Um, glycogen is converted into glucose 6-phosphate and then glucose 1-phosphate, and that enters your glycolysis pathway, as I mentioned. And just this is briefly the hormones. You have your insulin, which is secreted right after you have a big meal. You have your glucagon, which is secreted, again, from your pancreas uh, if you've, after you've eaten for a bit and you are hungry and you need those glucose stores. And then you also have your adrenaline. And it, it does make sense, right? If, you, if your flight or fight response is triggered and you need that energy really quickly, you release a lot of adrenaline. And what that would do is it basically convert a lot of that glycogen to your glucose because that's the stores you need. Lipid synthesis. Okay. So now if you have a really high energy meal and you've already made your glycogen and you still have tons of energy laying, like, laying around, what you basically do is you produce your lipids, and those are really high energy sources, as Kevin mentioned. Those are pretty much the highest energy sources, which then are really crucial to things like gluconeogenesis. Um, so what basically happens is once we come to the acetyl-CoA stage, once, you have, once you've had your glycolysis, you've had your pyruvate decarboxylation, um, you get acetyl-CoA. And if in the state of, uh, in the fed state, which is right after you've had a meal, it gets converted into malonyl-CoA. Uh, this is quite important to know. Um, so just know that malonyl-CoA is uh, quite important. And this is known as the committing step. So once it's converted into malonyl-CoA, it has no other choice but to form a lipid. Um, it does require energy. So as we talked about in beta oxidation, where you break down the lipid two carbons at a time, this is practically the same thing in reverse. You build up a lipid and a fatty acid by adding two carbons at one time. And this requires ATP as well as NADPH. Now, what the hell is NADPH? Um, do you have any questions? Okay. Uh, so NADPH, it's quite similar to NADH. It's an, en it's an energy store, but the primary difference is how it's produced. So it's produced via the pentose phosphate pathway, and you don't really need to know this. You need to know that it's involved in um, lipid synthesis, practically. Okay, so you mentioned... Um, your lipids, you also have your triacylglycerides. Yeah? 
So you have your glycerol 3 phosphate synthesis in your liver. If you're trying to form a lipid, you need to go back to that fatty acid and your glycerol backbone and then join them again to form lipid, right? So you have your glycerol 3 phosphate synthesis, which takes place in your liver, and then you have your uh, a very similar process taking place in your adipocytes, which are your fat cells. So the two basic areas where you have your triacylglyceride synthesis are your livers and your adipocytes or your fat cells. Again, we've already gone through this, so you have your two fatty acid chains being added at one time. And you also have a phospholipid synthesis, which is an additional step if you are trying to form things like um, phospholipids for your lipid membranes. And then you'd add a head group, uh, choline being one of them, onto one of those three fatty acid groups. Cholesterol synthesis, um, it's quite similar to lipid synthesis. It starts with the acetyl coa you end up with cholesterol. There's tons of really confusing stuff which is involved. You do not need to know that. Um, the important thing you need to know is this enzyme, HMG-CoA reductase, sensor hydroxymethylglutrile-CoA reductase. You do not need to know that full form. But it is important for pharmacological intervention. So if you think about it, if you're able to kind of inhibit this enzyme, you can lower cholesterol levels because you prevent the conversion of your acetyl-CoA's to cholesterol. And your lipid mobilization is basically, okay, you've had your lipid stores produced, you have certain lipid stores already, but in a state of low glucose, low glycogen, you need certain sources of glucose, and that's where your gluconeogenesis kicks in, and your lipids come out. Um, and it's basically carried through the, blood, through the bloodstream uh, by the serum and through all these lipoproteins we mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a diagram which was mentioned to us quite a bit, and I found this to be really good in kind of understanding what basically happens. So from your intestine, you have your chylomicrons, uh, which are your fatty acids, um, they enter the capillaries, taken up by the liver. Um, and then you have your VLDLs, LDLs, and HDLs. The only important thing, for example, purposes you need to know is that VLDLs and LDLs aren't good. Uh, they basically involve um, the transfer of your fats from, the, from your liver to your adipocytes, which you don't really want in the grand scheme of things because that leads to things like atherosclerosis, plaque buildup, and coronary artery disease, and so on. Your HDLs, on the other hand, those are your good lipids. So they involve the transport of your cholesterol from your extrahepatic tissue, which is basically any tissue outside of the liver, back to the liver. Okay, MCQ time. Atrovastatin, which is a drug you cover in second semester, is a drug used to lower cholesterol by inhibiting an enzyme. Which enzyme would you expect this to be? A, hands up for A, B, C, D, E. Perfect. Okay, so which of the following statements is true? Have a read. Um, a, lipid released by the liver travels through the bloodstream in chylomicrons. Uh, B, the release of triglycerides from low-density lipoproteins from, from very low-density lipoproteins. Lipids released by adipocytes travel bound to serum albumin, and elevated high-density lipoprotein levels are implicated in the size cut off, unfortunately. But I don't think that's the answer anyway. Um, okay. <laughs> Hands up for A, B, C, yep. So the reason A is wrong is because it's not chylomicrons. Chylomicrons is from your intestine to your liver. Once it's already reached the liver, it'll be transported through VLDLs, which then gets converted into LDLs. Your VLDLs being your very low density lipoproteins, and your LDLs being the low density ones. The release of triglycerides from low-density lipoproteins forms very low. It's actually the other way around. So as I mentioned, your liver releases VLDLs, which gets converted to LDLs. Um, and also because your lipids are hydrophobic, you can't actually just have them in your blood, so they need to be bound to your serum albumin. Okay, here we go again. Um, source of blood glucose. This was already mentioned, so I won't go into a lot of the details about this. I have a few questions, which should, again, cover this pretty well. Um, so at the start of any meal, you have your endogenous glucose, which is glucose from the meal you just took in. Once that starts depleting after about four hours or so, you have your glycogen or your glycogenolysis, and that's the use of your glycogen stores in your liver and in your skeletal muscle. And then once that's already all gone, you transition to your gluconeogenesis, which is quite important in long-term starvation and fasting states. Um, also for a sprint, this is a diagram Kevin had as well, and he covered it pretty well. So just at the start, you have a high level of fats being used, 
um, but then you move on to your carbohydrates to meet the acute demand of like running, which I don't know why you'd do. Um, and then you eventually transition on to fat later on. So um, would you guys want me to cover this? Because um, it was called pretty well. So just important to know creatine phosphate, that's your burst of energy. You have your Cori cycle which takes place and that's to basically get rid of the lactate in your blood because that causes cramping as you mentioned earlier. Um, your heart muscle is really important because it does not have any stores. As Kevin mentioned in an ischemic event, you'd be really cautious about uh, damage to the heart um, and it derives most of its energy from fatty acids. So most, your general body uses fatty acids at rest. You don't have a need to use high levels of glucose. Glucose is Glucose levels just maintain your blood glucose level, usually. Um, but in acute phases, and if you're running, um, you could use glucose and ketones as an energy source. The brain also does not have any fuel resources, so it's really important in an ischemic event. Um, it drives energy from blood glucose, and again, can use ketones just like the heart. And red blood cells, as I said, they do not undergo aerobic respiration. Why don't they undergo aerobic respiration? You don't want to use the oxygen they are meant to be carrying. That's kind of counterintuitive. So you undergo fermentation and glycolysis, which doesn't really need ATP. And it also involves the pentose phosphate pathway, which has to do with that NADPH, which was mentioned earlier. Okay, so MCQ time once more. Um, a revenge lecturer, not gonna say who, had dinner at six, stayed up till 2 a.m. last night to finish these slides, uh, woke up at eight, ATM. So which process is likely to be supplying most of their blood glucose? So is it A, hands up for A, B, C? Yep. So the answer here is C, and the reason it's C is because you're already talking about long term. So if I had a meal at 6 and I'm talking about waking up at 8 a.m., that's over 12 hours. And at that point, you'd already have your glycogen stores completely depleted and moved on to your gluconeogenesis and your fatty acid, synthesis, uh, fatty acid metabolism pathways. Okay, Akhil took a short break from carrying the entire cohort on his back. 30 minutes after lunch, um, which process is likely to be supplying most of his blood glucose? So do you, would, it, would it be his dietary glucose, glycogenolysis, or glycogenesis? So hands up for A, B, C. So the answer is A because this is quite immediately after a meal. Um, so between 30 minutes to about two hours, you do have your glycogen use and then uh, your glucose use and then you move on to uh, glycogenolysis. Study is often linked to a marathon. Uh, in the real marathon, which is the primary source of energy immediately before the start of a marathon. So hands up for A, B, C, D. Yep, so your stored fats at rest, the primary energy source are your stored fats. During Aditya's iconic MedCamp milk sprint, what was the primary source of ADP? Um, so that'd be A, hands up for A, B, you better get this right, C, D, yeah, so it's your creatine phosphate. So if you're, if you're sprinting, as Kevin mentioned, for the initial burst of energy, you have your creatine phosphate, and um, at later points of time, you'd move on to your carbs and your stored fats. What's the primary source of ADP in your body five minutes into a run? Hands up for A, B, C, or D. So the answer is A. Um, that's because you use up your creatine phosphate within the first few minutes, um, and your stored fats kick in after about 15 to 30 minutes. So between that, you have your carbohydrates being used, um, things like glycogenolysis and stuff. Does anyone have any questions from that? Nope. So we're just gonna finish up real quick. Yep. So would that be like the absolute numbers? Yep. Yep. Um, I I could try putting one up, but. For, for exam purposes, what you need to know is that your key energy sources throughout your day are your fats, and that's what you use. 
but then you talk about blood glucose and when it comes to certain substrates you talk about times of the day and how that relates to your meals and the time since a meal so that's where you have your glucose levels and so on and you're sprinting with your creatine phosphate but normally it's just fat yep um, so really quickly we're going to go through drug metabolism and alcohol metabolism um, so your drug metabolism you, it would be covered more in your farm lectures and a bit more in stem two um, two stages you have your modification and conjugation so you usually take in the drug and uh, it undergoes certain modifications. It makes this more water soluble and more metabolically active. So most of the drugs you take in are metabolically inert, which means they themselves can't actually cause the desired change. They undergo modifications. This might be in the liver or in the kidneys. And once that takes place, um, they become more reactive. Um, this is also often risky because you have certain intermediates which are toxic. So I'm sure you all have heard of like things like paracetamol overdose, and that involves certain intermediates formed because of this modification state, which can be really toxic and cause liver disease. Um, and once you've already had that, when, once the drugs have already had their effects, you have your conjugation, which basically removes stuff, um, makes it less metabolically active, and that's just excreted in the liver. So a common example given is aspirin. So your aspirin itself is not metabolically active. It's modified into salicylic acid, which is the active form or the active ingredient of aspirin. And once that's had its effect, it undergoes conjugation uh, to salicylic, phenolic, gluco, uh, not important. And this basically allows it to be excreted through the, through the liver and uh, through the kidneys, through urine. Alcohol metabolism. Um, I wish you guys had the ICL before med camp. I really do. Um, so it basically occurs in the liver. So you have your alcohol, which in, it in itself is toxic. So it's converted into acetaldehyde by alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, these two terms are quite important and they come up quite a bit. And this requires NAD plus, right? Your acetaldehyde itself is quite toxic because you, in the grand scheme of things, you can think of, of alcohol as another drug. So your acetaldehyde is your metabolically active form, and then that's converted to acetic acid by your aldehyde dehydrogenase, which is then uh, uh, excreted through the kidneys. Um, yeah, and they require NAD+. Okay, so the alcohol flush reaction is caused by buildup of acetaldehyde in alcohol catabolism, which I'm sure I'm going to see tons of at Medball. Um, why would this happen? So, hands up, have a read. Hands up for A. Hands up for B. C. D. E. Okay. So, the answer here is both A and B. And the reason that is because you basically have two reactions taking place. So, one converts your alcohol to your acetaldehyde, and one converts your acetaldehyde to your acetic acid. So if one's either too active or one's not efficiently active, you get this buildup of acetaldehyde, which is what effectively causes that alcohol flush. Which compound is best described as a highly branched chain of glucose joined by alpha-1,4 and alpha-1,6 bonds? Hands up for A, B, C, D, Yep, most of you got that right. If you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. Or if, yep, sorry. Yep. So your microsomal ethanol oxidizing system is basically another subsystem which takes place in your mitochondria. Um, it's also active in certain cells which are, aren't able to undergo that alcohol dehydrogenase pathway or lack the enzyme. So that's just an alternative kind of use. And as Kevin mentioned, alcohol is quite um, energy dense. Uh, so you might use this pathway to produce energy through your mitochondria. Which of the following compounds is least readily met met uh, metabolized in the human body? We went through this. So A, hands up for A. B, C, or D. Yep, cellulose. So cellulose contains your uh, beta 1416 bonds, which can't be acted upon by your normal enzymes. So that's what your roughage is, basically. 
The fermentation of pyruvate in humans produces which product? Pretty easy, should be. Hands up for A. B. C. D. Or E. Yep, so the answer is lactate, which produces your lactic acid, which you need to get rid of, or you'll get cramps. The fermentation of pyruvate to lactate by lactate dehydrogenase produces how many ATP? Hands up for A. B. C, D, or E? Yep, so the answer is A, zero. So it's a bit of a trick question. Um, so it effectively does not produce any ATP, and the reason that is is because the basic use of the NADH and NAD+, plus is just to regenerate this NAD+, plus, okay? It does not actually enter the citric acid cycle or the electron transport chain to get that 2.5 ATP, which you normally would expect. In eukaryotic cells, where does the citric acid cycle take place? Hands up for A, B, C, D. Yep, the answer is B. In the, cat in the catabolism of triglycerides, where is the most energy captured? So hands up for A, B, C, or D. Yeah, the answer is C. Um, if, you, if you think of beta oxidation, you have one NADH and one FADH2 per acetyl-CoA. However, for your citric acid cycle, you actually have way more um, NADH and FADH2 being released. So beta oxidation is great for producing acetyl-CoA, but it doesn't actually release a lot of energy. And we're coming close. So which statement is false? Option A. A, hands up for A, B, C, D, no one really knows what's happening. <laughs> so your glycogen phosphorylase, it basically involves the, the, as I said, phosphorylation of your glycogen to release that glucose. Insulin would result in formation of glycogen and not breakdown of glycogen. So you would not phosphorylate glycogen, you'd phosphorylate glucose to form glycogen. Which statement about tri uh, uh, triglyceride synthesis is false? The key regulatory step is conversion of acetyl-CoA to malonyl-CoA. <coughs> oh, hands up for A. B. C. D. Yep, why is C wrong? Yep, got you there. So it's NADPH and not NADH. Which can't use ketone bodies in starvation? Should be easy. Hands up for A. B. C. D. E. Yep, so your red blood cells can only use glycolysis. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank, you, thank you so much for coming down. Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to message me. And I know you've probably heard this enough, but try not to stress too much. I know it's your first exam, and I'm sure all of you are really, really hyper and studying tons. Um, it's important you look after yourself and just look out for each other, and you should be good. Best of luck. Um, also, guys, we have tons of sushi, which will be outside in a minute, so should be good.